Here's another fine performer, Guy Hovis. And Guy gets some nice backing on guitar by Neil Levang on this pretty song written by Chris Christofferson. I'm curious to know your economic perspective. Roughly 12,000 years ago, the human species transitioned from nomadic hunter-gatherer societies. Don't look so sad. Tribes foraging and hunting with no real agricultural skills to farm cultivating settled societies. What in your view are the moral highs and lows of free market and socialist economies? I, I think wealth inequality is a real problem and I think socialism is a, in the extreme, is a failed response to that problem. I could go on a massive spiel about how an entirely new social system could be generated that takes in all the needs of the entire human population at once. And probably the first thing that comes out of anyone listening to this will, feel, will be communism, because that's a right. general reaction, but that is not what it is at all. It's actually making a society that isn't an anti-society, which is what we have now. It's not to say we don't need a social safety net. I think we do, and I think we need an increasingly strong one. And the reason for that is, I think ultimately technology, if it works, will reduce the need for human labor. This has been termed the Neolithic Revolution. Before the Neolithic Revolution, as corroborated by numerous anthropologists studying both existing and historical hunter-gatherer societies. If we manage to build truly labor-saving devices. We can calculate society now. Science has only been with us really in application for about 600 years. We can calculate what the greatest conductor of conducting metal is and why it should be used in certain forms and not in others. You know, devices that don't simply just open up a space for new forms of human labor, but devices that actually cancel the need. We can apply this type of reasoning to everything. And I don't mean some utopianistic thing where suddenly there's a matrix and everything's calculated. That's an ideal. That probably isn't reality, at least not now. But that's the way we should approach our thought process for human labor. And I think we're doing that. Then you really have this, the, the ultimate recipe for an intolerable degree of wealth inequality. We have to arrive at conclusions, not base them on traditional notions or pre-existing systems. So when you take that frame of reference, it completely shatters the political system, it shatters the business system as we know it, it shatters this notion of free choice. And I say that in a very subtle way because when it comes down to it, we are not free. You chose chocolate, but you could have chosen vanilla. It certainly seems like this is the world we're living in. If we intend to survive on this planet, we have to align ourselves with the laws of nature and guide ourselves, and that's that. You feel that you want to move, and then you move. Okay, you are doing it. You, the conscious witness of your life. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, we, we know that both of these assumptions are just untrue. And that's a deep problem we have with the neuroses of freedom we have in the world today. But social and economic life was actually very different. Small bands or tribes operated without money or markets. There are ways in which this can be mitigated by you know, some democratizing force, you know, where everyone has access to this technology. But I think ultimately we need something like a universal basic income. Uh, there has to be some way to distribute this kind of technological wealth more fairly to the rest of the world. And they were egalitarian, and they had no economic dominance hierarchy. I think if we were given time to, f to fruit out a non-competitive environment, to really see that collaboration is the most rewarding, and it's not to say we're all equal, it's to say that, yes, you contribute because your skill set is really good in one way, I contribute because my sk skill set is really good in another way, and we work together to make the best of it, not have a cutthroat personality okay, battle so because we think that one needs to be better than the other in this value system we have. How you do that is the difficult question, but that you need to do that at some point uh, seems to me to be a very easy question. It also is well established that they had much less violence, certainly no large-scale warfare. And it, it becomes especially easy if you imagine it in the extreme case uh, where we have the ultimate labor-saving technology. I mean, just imagine we have built the ultimate nanotechnology you know, run by perfect artificial intelligence. All the world. One of the great psychological revolutions, great sociological revolutions that has to occur if we intend to survive on this planet is we have to stop delegating decision making to people and delegating decision making to a process of rational thought and logic. So you have, you know, some kind of gray goo that can self-assemble into anything we want it to be. And while modern culture would gawk at the seemingly crude reality of hunter-gatherer life, it has been well argued, in fact, that there was a kind of minimalistic affluence 
Uh, happiness and simplicity. If you don't know you're poor, well, maybe you're not poor. A unique distinction because it challenges how we today think about social success or even progress itself. So the value system that is talked about where people, you have this assumption that people just want more and more and more bling and they want to be stylized. There might be some truth to that. We see African countries with their ornaments and everything, but that is very, very different from what's been put forward in the fashion neuroses that has come to define our culture today in America and the West. So, yeah. See, I would argue for the market and all the things that you and many others talk about if I wasn't aware of the fact that it's no longer needed with the, the state of science and technology to alleviate the corruption, you have to get rid of the psychological place of it. You have to, everyone's the same, basically. We're not, some people are not just more corrupt than others, they become that way. There's a reason, just to throw this in there psychologically, that those who have the highest uh, wages in the world donate less to poverty percentage-wise. There was a study done fairly recently that found that the most ruthless and the most wealthy people in the world, excuse me, the most wealthy were the most ruthless. They're most likely to cut people off in traffic. Excuse me, every social system has been based around scarcity. It's based around the assumption that there really isn't enough to go around, right? You go mm -hmm. back to Adam Smith, you go back to David Ricardo, you go back to Malthus, specifically Malthus, who in population theory firmly ingrained this stuff. You hear rhetoric uh, across the board from mainstream economists that this is based on the fact that we can't provide enough for everyone, therefore we have to restrict. Any machine, any machine process can be built from scratch, molecule by molecule, so cheaply that basically it can all be done for the cost of raw materials. This is no longer true. When it comes to actual sustainable life-supporting goods, when it comes to meeting the needs of the human population, maintaining a high level of public health, and of course assuring sustainability, we can actually create an abundance now. Mm -hmm. And this is all common sense to us. We know that the cutthroat mentality is there where they shared with no direct expectation of reciprocation. Think about that. There are even modern stories of outsiders having their first visit with these cultures, and they would be given things like handicrafts from the existing tribes, and the Western cultures would feel the need to give something in return, as many in our market exchange culture would. And this reciprocal behavior was actually considered offensive to the tribe, as they felt the exchange was a refusal of friendship. British anthropologist Tim Ingold highlights the difference between giving and exchange has to do with a social, social perception, I should say, based around autonomous companionship versus involuntary obligation. Autonomous companionship versus involuntary obligation. He states, clearly both hunter-gatherers and agricultural cultivators depend on their environments but whereas for cultivators, this dependency is framed within a structure of reciprocal obligation. For hunter-gatherers, it rests on the recognition of personal autonomy. The contrast is between relationships based on trust and those based on domination. I want to read that part again. The contrast is between relationships based on trust and those based on domination.